Hello again, everybody, and welcome to our breakout session on primary progressive aphasia and its effects on language. We're really, really fortunate to have with us Maya Henry today. So Dr. Maya Henry is an associate professor who's jointly appointed in the departments of speech, language and hearing sciences and neurology at the University of Texas at Austin. She's the director of the aphasia research and treatment lab. She teaches courses on aphasia and related neurogenic communication disorders as well as the cognitive and neural basis of speech and language. She has an NIH funded research um, grant that investigates the immediate and long-term benefits of interventions to promote communication and quality of life in primary progressive aphasia. And so I'm gonna um, turn things right over to um, Dr. Henry, who will have a presentation after which we will have time for some questions and we hope to have a good amount of time to take your questions today. I do wanna just remind people that with the nature of this presentation, if you wanna ask questions and keep them anonymous, please be mindful of uh, how you're entered in and anything, any changes you might wanna make. Folks will not be on camera, but your names might come through as you're asking questions if that's a concern for folks. And with that, Maya, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon, and thank you to the AFTD for inviting me to uh, talk with you all today about primary progressive aphasia, or PPA. I'm a speech language pathologist by training, and I've been working with individuals with PPA and their families for about 20 years now. Um, today, my goals are to talk with you about PPA and what it is, what kinds of changes in communication we see, um, a little bit about the underlying changes in the brain that we think um, are the basis for those communication challenges. And then I'd like to spend the bulk of our time talking about what we can do to promote communication for people facing this diagnosis. So some research investigating speech language interventions and also some, some kind of practical strategies for, for things that care partners can do um, as part of the team to help to promote communication. So with that, I'd like to start to, uh, by talking just a little bit about communication in the context of healthy aging. Um, it's often or maybe even always the case that when I give a talk about primary progressive aphasia to, uh, to lay audiences, someone usually comes up to me after the talk and says, I think I have that. I have a lot of trouble coming up with people's names um, or coming up with words when I need them in conversation. Um, and I, and I, usually can reassure people by letting them know that that challenges with coming up with words when we want them in conversation is probably the most universal complaint in terms of healthy aging. Um, and we know the research shows us that word finding or naming does decline with age, but importantly, this is difficulty with accessing words when we need them rather than a loss of vocabulary or a deterioration of knowledge underlyingly. In fact, we know that older adults actually outperform younger adults on vocabulary tests and semantic memory, which is a, just a term for our conceptual knowledge about things and people in the world is well preserved into old age. So word finding is very typical uh, with healthy aging. So when does a speech language pathologist start to become concerned that the types of changes that we're seeing in communication are not normal, but maybe a sign of something we should be concerned about? Uh, so when we see a decline in language that is rapid or that's occurring in people who are relatively young, we start to get concerned. And when we see changes in cognitive or even speech motor processes that aren't typically affected, um, we start to get concerned. So the ability to come up with really familiar names of like common objects or family members, the ability to articulate words, to be intelligible when we speak, uh, the ability to speak in complete sentences. When people have a, seem to have a loss of, of conceptual knowledge and they don't know what words mean anymore, or when they can't hold on to information that they've just heard, then we start to get concerned um, and we may recommend a full speech language evaluation to see if there's something more going on. Uh, what a, a full speech language evaluation can reveal in some cases is the presence of aphasia. And aphasia is really just an acquired language impairment. 
So in a, in a person who's had typically developing language and a normal language system throughout their life, they start to have difficulty. We call that aphasia. And aphasia has a number of components. People may have trouble with spoken language or typically have trouble with spoken language. Uh, almost always, this means they have trouble retrieving words. Um, they may also have difficulty with articulatory aspects or motor speech. So their speech may become distorted in the way that it sounds. Uh, most people will have some degree of difficulty understanding what others are saying. So it's rare that aphasia is just expressive or receptive. And most of the time people will have some trouble with written language as well. In most cases that a speech language pathologist will be working with, aphasia is caused by a stroke. Um, this is certainly the most pervasive context for aphasia. And in people who've had a stroke, there's a, a relatively sudden onset, and if anything, a gradual recovery of function over time. When we do an MRI scan of someone who's had a stroke, this is the kind of change that we see in the brain. So you see a healthy brain above in a lateral and here in, in what we call an axial view and on the brain below. So the, the left side of the brain is indicated um, with the L here. You can see what well, looks like a big black hole. And there's, this is a, a, a stroke that occurred some time ago where there's been basically a death of brain tissue and, and cerebrospinal fluid has filled in, which appears as black. And in people with aphasia, we typically see that it's the left side of the brain that's affected, the left side being the dominant hemisphere for language in most people. Um, and, and you may have heard of some of these kind of classical uh, brain regions, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, and the connections between them that have been implicated in language um, really since the 1800s, since some early ca cases were investigated by these um, famous uh, neuropathologists. And um, so we can see strokes that are more anteriorly in the brain affecting the frontal lobe or strokes affecting more posterior regions. Um, and different types of aphasia come about by, uh, depending on the location of the damage in the brain. So really damage to almost anywhere in this broad left hemisphere region can affect language in some way. And what we've come to learn through neuroimaging in, in healthy individuals and those with language disorders is that um, discrete brain regions work together in networks to support uh, a number of communication functions from speech production to speech perception, processing of conceptual knowledge or semantics and written language processing. And here all those networks are in the, in the center are overlaid on top of one another. So you can really start to get a sense of how damage to any region within this broad left hemisphere area could disrupt any or, or multiple of these processes. So I've told you that most of the patients that we see as speech language pathologists who have aphasia have had a stroke, um, but increasingly we are getting referrals uh, for individuals who haven't had a stroke and who have a gradual onset of communication challenges. And very often what these people will tell us when they come to our, our lab or our clinic um, about what they first noticed is something along these lines. So in my opinion, it started about two years ago. I was walking my dog and I started looking down and saying, what is that? I walk on it all the time, but I don't know what that's called anymore. And then she goes on to say, that's when she finally went to the doctor and realized that something was really wrong, right? So she's looking down in this very familiar thing she can't retrieve the word for. So she starts to get very, very concerned. And in the beginning, this is a very, very subtle problem. And people may just think they're tired or stressed or depressed. And they may even go to their neurologist and be told, well, you're, you're stressed or tired or depressed um, because this, the changes are often so very subtle early on. But when those early and mild language difficulties continue to pro progress to become more of a, uh, a profound disruption of language, um, a person may get a, a diagnosis of primary progressive aphasia, which is aphasia caused by an underlying neurodegenerative disease. And what we see in the brain in these individuals looks quite different. So here you see a brain of someone who's had a stroke above and below, we see this loss of brain tissue um, that's caused by underlying neurodegenerative disease. So atrophy in the brain. 
Okay, primary progressive aphasia as a diagnostic entity has been around for quite some time, but we have only in the last couple of decades started to uh, get these referrals as speech language pathologists. Um, and so individuals with PPA are being more consistently diagnosed and more and diagnosed earlier in the process. And, and some of them are getting referred to speech language pathologists for care, although many are not. Um, so just to sort of operationalize what PPA is, again, this is aphasia caused by underlying neurodegenerative disease where the most prominent feature is an issue with communication. So not an issue with memory, not an issue with behavior. And this is what distinguishes PPA from other types of dementia. As with the other FTD syndromes, uh, PPA may affect individuals who are quite young, who have children still living at home, who are still working, et cetera. Any of a number of neurodegenerative diseases or underlying pathologies can cause PPA. The common theme is that speech and language networks are affected. So what are the kinds of things that we see in PPA in terms of communication changes? Early on, we hear something from our patients that very often sounds like this. I know what I wanna say, but I just can't say it. And when people are having this difficulty with retrieving words, they may say the wrong word, like dog for cat, or they may have trouble assembling the sounds and say bog instead of dog. They may have trouble accessing concepts or recognizing words that they hear, even familiar words like pencil. Some will have trouble assembling words into sentences and their language becomes what we call telegraphic, my house and son and dinner. And some will have a lot of trouble with articulating words or speaking intelligibly. And these different features can co-occur. Some individuals have a hard time holding on to information that they've heard. So if I say a phone number and you have to walk across the room to write it down and that becomes challenging to you in a way that it wasn't before. Um, and as I've said, uh, many individuals with aphasia have trouble with reading and writing as well. So these different features, as I've said, can, can, can uh, co-occur and do co-occur in what are now pretty widely recognized PPA syndromes. And so those of you who have a PPA diagnosis or a family member or loved one with a PPA diagnosis, you may have come across some of this terminology, which I think can be confusing. So I wanna talk about it a little bit. Um, there is a non-fluent agrammatic type of PPA where individuals have slow, halting and effortful speech. They often have trouble with speaking in sentences or with coordinating the muscles of articulation. The semantic variant of PPA, which has also been called semantic dementia. Um, in this type of PPA, there's a loss of conceptual knowledge. People may not have trouble with articulating words or speaking in sentences, but their language may become increasingly empty of content, and they may have trouble comprehending words that other people are saying. Logopenic PPA. So logopenia is a not very helpful word from the neurology world that basically means a paucity of output, lots of pauses for word finding, and some difficulty with holding on to information that one has heard. Um, and, and, and more broadly, a challenge with processing sounds in words or what we call phonological processing. These first two subtypes are considered to be subtypes of, of FTD, whereas logopenic variant PPA is associated with Alzheimer's pathology underlyingly. For our purposes today, really, um, it doesn't matter with it, whether this is FTD underlyingly or AD underlyingly. We're going to talk broadly about interventions and strategies that are applicable in PPA. Okay, one of the things that we've learned in the last couple of decades is that these different clinical syndromes tend to be predictive of underlying disease. So speech language pathologists actually play a role in helping to identify what the likely disease is in the brain, along with, of course, many other biomarkers. Um, and we see different patterns of atrophy underlyingly as well, with the frontal lobe affected in non-fluent patients, the anterior temporal lobe affected in semantic variant patients, and this temporoparietal region affected in logopenic individuals. Importantly, 
PPA is a relatively isolated speech and language problem, at least for the initial stages of the disorder. And so uh, when we do comprehensive neuropsychological testing, but also when we hear about the kinds of challenges that people are facing in their everyday life, we see that in PPA, episodic memory or memory for events, reasoning skills, a person's sense of humor and general intelligence, their sense of direction and other visuospatial abilities tend to be spared, as do artistic abilities. And sometimes we actually see a flourishing of interests and aptitudes that are artistic in the context of PPA and other types of FTD and physical skills. So individuals tend to be very physically healthy in many cases. However, with the progression of the disease, people, what, what, what begins as a relatively isolated communication problem becomes a much more profound communication problem. And most people will start to have difficulty with other things, including memory and attention, calculations and math skills, problem solving, visuospatial skills, unusual behaviors and pragmatic behavioral changes may occur, and there may be concomitant motoric impairments. So uh, especially in the context of the non-fluent variant of PPA, we may see the, a more global motor uh, syndrome emerge like progressive supranuclear palsy or corticobasal syndrome. So what are researchers doing to try to understand PPA better? And most importantly, from my perspective, to try to offer uh, meaningful functional care for patients and families. There's a great deal of research underway um, and some of which uh, has been highlighted at this meeting um, with regard to the disease processes that cause PPA and FTD more broadly. We've learned a lot about what parts of the brain are affected um, and of course, there are a number of clinical trials underway investigating the potential for pharmacological intervention in FTD, including PPA, but there's not a, there, there hasn't been um, a drug trial that's shown a great deal of promise with these individuals as of yet. And then of course, my area of interest um, is in behavioral treatment or speech language intervention for primary progressive aphasia. So that's what I'd like to talk about uh, for the, the rest of my presentation today. Um, just so you know, there's a robust literature base supporting speech and language treatment for people who've had stroke, uh, who have aphasia in the context of stroke, I should say. And most or all individuals, at least in the United States, who have aphasia post-stroke will be referred for speech language treatment Speech language therapy and PPA also holds promising results. And we, we did a recent review of the literature and found nearly 90 studies evaluating the benefits of speech language intervention in PPA. Most small group studies are single participants, but some randomized controlled trials emerging. Uh, relative to the hundreds of studies in stroke patients, though, there's considerably less research in this population. And I would say that both on the clinical research side of things and in terms of standard clinical care, there continues to be an attitude of what's been called therapeutic nihilism on the part of referring clinicians like neurologists, but also unfortunately treating clinicians. So individuals with PPA still are not being consistently referred to speech language treatment. And when they are, sometimes speech language pathologists take the attitude uh, which, which comes from lack of information and understanding that maybe there's nothing we can do to help. And I think that's a real shame. And the work in my lab and others um, has, has really tried to move the needle so that speech language treatment is recognized as an important option for people with PPA and their families. The goal of speech language intervention in PPA is functional communication designed to improve communicative quality of life. And so what this means to the clinician is trying to maximize communication at each stage of the illness, to consider the person with PPA in the context of their environments and develop individually tailored treatment approaches that will meet their functional needs, and to really tailor the approach, not to just where they are, but always taking into account where they're going to be, likely going to be. So in six months, in 12 months, in two years, we should be thinking about the communication needs down the road as well. And that's the real challenge for the clinician who's not necessarily trained to think that way. 
So as speech language pathologists, we have a number of tools at hand that we can offer to patients with, and their families. These are some broad types of treatment. At the top, you see restitutive. These are interventions designed to rebuild lost skills. Uh, we also have aided approaches. These are more compensatory in nature, designed to help an individual to work around or compensate for their difficulties with communication. And then at the bottom, environmental support and care partner training. So really thinking about the person with aphasia, not just in isolation, but their environment and thinking about communication really as a, a two-way street um, and focusing our intervention efforts, not just on the person with aphasia. Uh, we can think about applying all of these in PPA and maybe shifting from a relatively greater emphasis on rebuilding in the mildest patients to, to really directing our intervention efforts um, to shift the burden away from the person with aphasia with progression and with increased severity, not only of communication, but also of other cognitive and motor deficits. I wanna tell you about a couple of restitutive treatments just briefly that we've investigated in my research. Um, most individuals with PPA have trouble with word retrieval or lexical retrieval, as we call it. And so we've designed an intervention that is really geared toward helping them to retrieve whatever information they can about a word that they're unable to retrieve. So what the research tells us is that when someone can't say a word, they can often generate meaningful information such as uh, semantic descriptors. So if I'm trying to talk about these things on my face, I could say, oh, you know, I use them to help me see. They have frames and lenses. Um, I keep them in a case in my purse. And even if I can't retrieve the word, I've helped you to understand what I'm talking about. So, uh, often individuals can retrieve part of the word, so the first letter or the first sound. And so we encourage them to systematically try to come up with whatever information they can to try to self-cue and give their listener whatever information they can. Um, so we walk them through these training steps that I won't go into, into detail uh, about right now, but basically this involves systematic training in retrieving this kind of res residual information in hopes of helping the person to come up with the word. And we work on personally relevant vocabulary. And then we have, oops, home practice modules that involve repeated production of functional vocabulary. These are some outcomes from a paper from a couple years ago from our lab showing um, the effects on vocabulary, really. And what we see at pre-treatment is that people can't name very many of these functional items. At post-treatment, a couple of months later, they're at nearly 90% correct. And really importantly, in the face of this therapeutic nihilism that I've described, people are maintaining these benefits up to one year post-treatment, okay? So it's not just uh, fleeting benefits that people are seeing. And people are getting better even at untrained vocabulary. So here's pre-treatment for untrained words and post-treatment, certainly not as robust as for the trained words, but this suggests that their strat the strategy that we're teaching them is more broadly beneficial than just for trained words. For people who have more trouble with speaking fluently, so the non-fluent patients who have trouble with speech production and grammar and articulation, and they have, in many cases, that telegraphic language that I was talking about, we've developed an intervention called video implemented script training. Uh, the, the person with PPA works closely with the clinician in a collaborative process to develop what we call these scripts about functional topics. So about their career, their family, their hobbies, about PPA in many cases. And then they work with the clinician on using those scripts in conversation, memorizing them and producing them in conversation. But they, they do most of the work at home, speaking in unison with a video model of a healthy speaker. So they see the person's mouth producing their scripted content, which is tailored in, in both the information, but also the difficulty level to their needs. And they speak in unison with this video for 30 minutes a day. So it's a lot of intensive practice. Here are some outcomes, again, up to one year post-treatment. So at pre-treatment, we see that people are able to correctly and intelligibly, so in a, in a way that can be understood by others, produce scripted content at about 40% correct at pre-treatment and at post-treatment, they're getting much closer to 
really perfect script production. And these benefits are maintained, again, up to one year post-treatment, which we think is really, really encouraging. So there seems to be some protective benefit of working on language. Now, just a, a, a little bit about aided approaches, which can take so many different forms. Uh, my colleague um, at Oregon Health Sciences, Health and Sciences University, Melanie Friedogan, who's really an expert in this area, has put it this way, that the, the challenge for the clinician is to put the individual's residual lexicon or vocabulary visually in front of them so that they can access needed words to participate in activities as language skills decline. And so that's the kind of the common thread, but the way this is done can take many, many different forms from really low tech options, what, what we call sort of paper communication books, uh, photo albums, communication boards, um, and, and simple pencil and paper. Um, and then there are of course more, much more high tech options like dedicated speech generating devices, mobile technology apps for phones and iPads. Um, the one big caveat for all of these high-tech options is that the clinician and the family should be very aware of the, the technical skills of the person with PPA. So we don't want to be introducing new complicated technology to somebody with PPA that's going to be potentially more and more difficult for them to use. So this really should be tailored to the sort of the comfort and familiarity level of the individual with PPA. And then just a brief word on communication partner training. So I think a really nice model for this is being tested by Anna Volkmer at the University College London. Um, so she's developed an intervention called Better Conversations with PPA. And this really takes treatment and makes it dyadic. So bringing communication partners into the process um, she'll video, in this treatment, Dr. Volkmer videotapes individuals with PPA and their communication partners, and then together they identify facilitators and barriers to communication and develop individually tailored goals, not just for the person with PPA, but for the care partner as well, to really try to maximize communication in the pair of people. Their uh, results from this study are still pending, but I'm really excited to see them um, and very hopeful that this is going to be yet another option uh, for intervention for, for people with PPA. In the little bit of time that I have left, I want to talk about communication strategies for care partners. So in Better Conversations, the, the intervention that Dr. Volkmer's developed, um, strategies will be identified um, specifically for a given care partner, but there are also some general strategies that are kind of a good idea. Things like making good eye contact before you communicate, communicating face-to-face -face in a quiet environment, um, confirming the information uh, that you've received from the person with aphasia by asking questions, by restating what you've heard, by paraphrasing, et cetera. Um, I won't go through all of these in detail, um, my assumption is these, that these slides will be available by the uh, AFTD, but I'm also happy to make them available um, if you email me. I wanna focus on what's called multimodal communication. And this just means using all of the different communication strategies and modalities on hand. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. This is kind of a helpful acrostic for, uh, for, for aphasia-friendly communication from uh, the National Aphasia Association, uh, ask simple direct questions, provide multiple communication options, help if asked, acknowledge frustration, speak slowly and clearly. If you don't understand, say so. So in other words, don't pretend that you understand when you don't and allow extra time for communication. Uh, this one is incredibly important. People with aphasia tell us so often that conversation just moves too quickly. They can't follow it and they have a really hard time inserting themselves into conversation because it just takes them longer to formulate and to initiate. Some other important things to remember, don't speak on someone's behalf unless they ask you to do so or unless it's absolutely necessary. Uh, multimodal communication is key, and I'll talk specifically about multi -commu multimodal communication on the next slide. Um, don't test and don't focus on errors. Very often, family members and loved ones feel that um, they shouldn't help 
they shouldn't jump in um, and try to assist that they, even if they know what the person with aphasia is trying to communicate, they should still hold back kind of like a test um, to make them really exercise the muscle of language. Um, and, and really this does much more harm than good. So don't feel the need to test. The goal is not perfect communication. The goal is communication. And if you know what the person with PPA is trying to say, that's good enough. Okay, and now a little bit more about multimodal communication. So what this really means is using all communication modalities, both verbal and nonverbal. And this is something the person with PPA can do, and you can do it as well as a communication partner. So use your hands to gesture in conduct conjunction with spoken language. Write down words or parts of words that may, may help to communicate a message. Draw a picture. It's worth a thousand words. Take advantage of body language, eye contact, facial expressions as uh, really important conveyors of information in addition to the spoken content of what you say. When you use multimodality communication, you are reinforcing the normalcy of these strategies. You're also providing redundancy in your message. So if you write a word as you're talking to the person with PPA, they're going to see you using that strategy that may also be helpful for them. Encourage circumlocution. So for some people with PPA who have trouble with word retrieval, if they try to talk around the word, it can be very beneficial. So if you can't think of the word, describe it. You know, it's the thing that you write with. It has ink. If I tell you that, you know exactly what I'm going for, right? So I've, I've just circumlocuted successfully. Uh, this provides valuable information to the listener. And as I said earlier in the talk, when people engage in circumlocution, sometimes it helps them to self-cue and find the word. Some other things to remember, um, fatigue certainly affects communication for all of us. So save your important discussions for a time when the person with PPA is well rested, if possible. Communication abilities may be, actually will be inconsistent for the person with PPA. And just because they could say it yesterday doesn't mean that they'll be able to say it today. Okay, to sum up and hopefully save a bit of time for questions, um, today I've described for you what PPA is, progressive loss of communication caused by underlying neurodegenerative disease, and any of the brain networks responsible for these different com components of speech or language may be affected. Intervention for PPA is efficacious and warranted. This really is the mission of my research and other research groups to try to get the word out so that these individuals will be referred to us for treatment because there's so much that we can do regardless of the stage of PPA, whether we're working on trying to rebuild language or trying to train family members and communication partners to promote and facilitate language in a partnership with the person with PPA. And so we rounded out today's talk um, with some specific strategies that may help to promote and facilitate communication for the person with PPA. I want to mention that our research is ongoing. We have an NIH funded clinical trial and are happy to take referrals. We see almost everybody remotely, even before the pandemic. So we work with patients all over the world. Um, and we can send them a teletherapy kit if they need one. Uh, we find that people who join our research project um, actually like doing treatment from the comfort of their own home. So don't hesitate to reach out if you have questions, um, if you have PPA or if someone that you know uh, may be a good fit for our treatment research, we'd be happy to tell you more. And with that, I can take any questions or comments that people may have. Thanks very much, Maya, for such a really wonderful presentation. Nice and clear. And you covered a lot of territory. So for this audience, which, as you can imagine, is a really engaged audience, there's a lot of questions. Um, You're great. So I'd actually like to just ask you to start um, back when you were speaking about clinical presentations and so what aphasia looks like. You made a really nice distinction between the cause of stroke aphasia and then the gradual um, progressive nature of PPA. But as you can imagine, people are struggling a little bit. So it does, does the PPA, does the, the aphasia look different if it's somebody with PSP or FTD? And does the aphasia symptoms and, and management look different if it's logopenic versus semantic? Uh, 
I wonder if you could just speak to some of that uh, briefly. Sure. Uh, so we use different terminology for PPA than we do for aphasia caused by stroke because aphasia does look different in the context of neurodegenerative disease. So, so that's one important point. Um, and then within the context of PPA, absolutely, there are unique constellations of features for semantic versus logopenic versus non-fluent PPA. Um, and so it's very important, uh, uh, at least from my vantage, to, to, to get a good diagnosis of PPA subtype when possible. Of course, not everybody fits into a subtype, um, but what the, the clinical variant of PPA tells us is what the, what the nature of the underlying problem is, whether it's difficulty with concepts, uh, in the case of semantic PPA, difficulty processing sounds in words in logopenic PPA, or difficulty with grammar and motor speech in non-fluent PPA. And so we will tailor our intervention to the specific, not only deficit, but also where it's coming from. So semantic and logopenic patients all have trouble with word retrieval, but for very different reasons. So loss of word meaning in the cause context of semantic PPA versus trouble assembling sounds in logopenic PPA. So our, our approach to working on word retrieval involves trying to get people to retrieve whatever information they've got, whether it's semantic or phonological. Um, but we think people benefit for different reasons. Okay, so we do use the same kind of intervention in my lab for semantic and logopenic individuals. And then we have script training for people with non-fluent PPA, which is actually quite different. The primary complaint in non-fluent PPA isn't as much about word retrieval. So yes, we absolutely want to tailor the intervention approach to, to the different subtypes. And, and as I mentioned, identifying clinical variant is also important for sort of the, the prediction of where the syndrome is likely to head. And so, so speech language pathology are uh, a part of the, the diagnostic team and early, identifying early and subtle features that may tell us whether this is PSP or CBD um, or Alzheimer's disease underlyingly. And then the, the cognitive and motor features that may emerge look different, of course, in, in the different syndromes as well. So I, I think I glossed over some of the detail there, but, but yes, I, I think... Um, it's, it's very important for speech language clinicians to understand and differentiate these different presentations. So I think that gives rise to an additional question, which, you know, so for people who want to try to get that level of detailed evaluation, mm -hmm. I think a lot of folks think FTD, they think neurology, mm -hmm. language disorder, it is important to think speech pathology, but what's the availability of that level of granular evaluation for folks who might not be in a really rich resource area or who can't get to your lab easily? Mm -hmm. I think you could speak to that a little bit because I think that is, you know, it's one of those issues that people confront all the time. Absolutely. It is, it, is a per, it is an issue for sure. If somebody doesn't live near an academic medical institution or a major referral site for FTD and PPA, they are likely, or, or just live in a bigger city, um, they are more likely to have trouble with identifying a specialist. They may, they may not see a neurologist who's super familiar with PPA, and there may not be speech language pathologists who um, have the right kind of training to help with differential diagnosis and to design the right treatment plan. But I think that is shifting. So um, as an educator in the field of speech language pathology, I have seen a huge shift in our training. So the information that we impart to new and upcoming speech language pathologists, I think we spent a day on discussing PPA when I was a graduate student in speech language pathology. And now we spend, you know, many weeks on it and people have uh, opportunities to get involved in uh, management of PPA at the graduate level. Um, one of the other sort of resources that avail is available is uh, the National Aphasia Association, which has a listing of clinicians who have experience with PPA specifically. Um, and one of the things that we offer in my lab is you know, not everybody's going to be appropriate for our, our clinical trial, but we will help with trying to find a clinician that's local to the, to the person and family um, who can, can do a good job. And, and the clinician doesn't have to be super experienced in PPA. They should have experience with aphasia and or motor speech impairment. Um, 
And they should be open to the idea that there are things that we can offer. And so clinicians in my lab will collaborate with clinicians all over the country to help design a treatment plan. And that's, that's something we feel really strongly uh, is a service that we can and should offer. And so if there are people out there who are looking for that kind of just help with coordinating care and finding the right kind of clinician, Um, We may not be able to directly offer treatment, but we can help to try to connect those dots. And I think that's um, that's one of the greatest needs that that individuals with PPA and their families face. You're absolutely right. It's just finding the right specialists. Well, And I think you're describing, too, that there's a there is an understanding of how hard some of these challenges are among folks who are really steeped in it. And so that kind of collaboration that you're offering and that you're speaking to is a really important reminder for folks. Um, and people can certainly reach out to us as well. We can try to help Absolutely. direct people through the helpline. There's a couple of questions about progression. So uh, is there anything right now that will stop the progression of PPA once it's started? The, the frank answer is that there's not, uh, there's not anything pharmacologically or behavioral intervention wise or neuromodulation that's going to halt the disease process. We don't have that yet. Of course, there are many, many trials underway, et cetera. Um, what we find is that with speech and language treatment, the targeted skills, so the specific areas that we work on in treatment show a different trajectory of decline. So we can slow the decline on those specific areas that we're working on. And that's what I tried to show with those figures. It's not a magic pill that cures the disease, um, but there does seem to be a prophylactic effect of working on speech and language in terms of the rapidity with which those changes take place. Thanks, appreciate it. One of the first questions that came in is pretty specific, and it's asking if there's any evidence that general anesthesia has a post-operative effect on people diagnosed with PPA. Um, this is something I've been asked a number of times, I think, because there are, there are people who, uh, who've experienced a change in their cognition and communication after going under general anesthesia, and there is evidence to show that in general, um, individuals with a diagnosis of some type of of dementia um, have worse cognitive outcomes after general anesthesia. Um, That's not universal by any means, but it can be a finding. And so while I don't think there's research in PPA specifically, um, I think the the, the work in dementia more broadly would suggest that yes, there can be an effect on, on cognitive functioning after general anesthesia. Great, thank you. Is the damage in different parts of the brain, uh, do you see damage in different parts of the brain for people who have um, PPA and are left-handed? Hmm, got a great question. Uh, so this is one of the great disservices to left-handed people that they often get excluded from aphasia research because they're unusual. Um, so left-handed people uh, most often still have language on the left side of the brain. Um, and, and then in the real difference between left and right-handed people is that a greater proportion of left-handed people do have right hemisphere language or my more bilateral, bilateral representation of language. Um, so again, most of them look just like right-handed people, but then in a subset of people, languages in the, le- the right hemisphere or more bilateral. And so in those cases, we can see a different or unexpected pattern in terms of the location of the underlying atrophy that's causing the aphasia. It may not be where we expect to see it. Um, And when we see atrophic changes in the right hemisphere, when we're reviewing cases in my lab, that's always my first question is, are they left-handed? Because that, that can be a pattern. Thank you so much. And I believe we're down to our last couple of minutes. Um, I, I'm going to ask you an additional question about progression, because I think it's something that people see again as they're watching what happens for their loved ones. So if you could just briefly speak to the idea of is, is the progression in PPA a linear process? Mm-hmm. It's in starts. Is there, um, you mentioned some of the research that's trying to be more predictive and understand the mm-hmm but could you just speak to sort of the practical nature of what progression might look like for folks who are dealing with symptoms day to day? Yeah, I, I'm, I 
caution people that I work with and clinicians that I work with um, that we should not be prognosticators because we're more likely to be wrong than right when it comes to predicting at the individual level. So we are, we've gotten better as a field at predicting patterns, predicting survival, predicting what sort of changes will emerge uh, at the group level, but in terms of individuals, there's a great deal of heterogeneity in terms of how rapidly people progress and whether the changes seem more linear or whether there are sort of fits and starts. But I can tell you anecdotally that there, there are individuals who progress what seems to me to be quite slowly. There are individuals who seem to progress more rapidly. And there are those who seem to be doing pretty well for a while and then seem to have sort of a... a um, a more rapid decline. And that may be related to some other, uh, some other health related change um, to stress in their life, et cetera. Uh, and so we'll see that, you know, in the context of treatment, somebody, someone may be doing pretty well for some time and then they have a UTI or they get sick or they need to have surgery. And then they have, they just have a much harder time sort of coming back from that. So certainly those other kind of general health and medical factors can, can play a role, but, but the, the less long winded reply would be that, no, I don't think we can say that it's linear. That's one of the things that makes planning a challenge for clinical professionals and absolutely for individuals and their families. So I think we have to leave it there, but thank you. I think it, it completely underscores the importance of really drilling down to the individual level. Absolutely. Everything around understanding what the the person needs, the person with the diagnosis needs, what the family means, needs to be matched to individual symptoms, individual resources, individual preferences. And I really appreciate that in the way that you've presented your work today and the, the importance of speech therapy. This is going to conclude our session. I, I thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Henry, and thank you all who have been attending the session with us.